The math behind the ancient science of music is not complicated. To do the necessary calculations, we only need the ability to manipulate fractions and ratios and to handle simple exponents and roots. Most people learn these operations in middle and high school. In theory, there is no reason why a dedicated 14-year-old of average intelligence cannot successfully engage with this material. But it may be that you haven't had to do this kind of math in many years. Or perhaps you think of yourself as someone who is not good at math, and this is a major mental block that prevents you from engaging with the mathematics of music. Maybe you are good at math, but you have difficulty imagining how the ancient Greeks conceived of mathematical ideas without the benefit of all the calculatory aids and notational conveniences that we have today. This video is designed to get all viewers, regardless of their background, onto the same page with the necessary mathematics before we engage with the text of the division itself. In order to do this, I have to be a little discursive and present information that might not seem relevant right now. The ancient Greeks integrated music deeply into their mathematical sciences, so it's difficult to talk about their approach to music theory without discussing their approach to numbers more generally. With that in mind, I ask that you bear with me as we go through material that might seem remote from musical reality. We have a lot of ground to cover, so without further ado, let's begin. Before discussing any specific mathematical machinery, we have to clarify the concept of number we are working with, because it's different in important ways from the concept of number we're familiar with from school and everyday life. The Greeks divided numbers into two main types, magnitudes and multitudes. Aristotle explains the difference in a passage from his Metaphysics. He writes, we call a quantity what is divisible into constituents, each of which has the nature of a one and a this. A certain quantity is a multitude if it is countable, a magnitude if it is measurable. That which is potentially divisible into non-continuous parts is called a multitude, into continuous a magnitude. A multitude, plethos in Greek, is a quantity of countable things, like soldiers or tennis balls. A magnitude, megathos in Greek, is a continuous quantity that does not naturally divide into individual countable objects. Think of water or electrical charge. We can only measure it, and we do this by deciding on a quantity to serve as a referential magnitude, which we call our unit. So we measure a mass of water in terms of liters, or electrical charge in amperes. For convenience, we anchor units like liters and amperes to well-known physical constants, but the choice of unit is really arbitrary. For example, there is no reason other than convention why an inch should be exactly as long as it is, and not slightly longer or shorter. In English, the distinction between multitude and magnitude is baked into our grammar. When asking about certain kinds of quantities, we say how many, that is, how many tennis balls, or how many soldiers. These are multitudes made up of countable things. For other quantities, we say how much. So, for example, how much water, or how much electrical charge. These are magnitudes, made up of measurable masses. The ancient Greeks divided their mathematical sciences four ways. A science could either deal with multitudes or magnitudes, and it could deal with these quantities absolutely or relative to other quantities. The science of absolute multitude is arithmetic. The science of absolute magnitude is geometry. The science of relative magnitude is astronomy, and the science of relative multitude is music. So when we study Greek music theory, we are dealing with multitudes and not magnitudes. The major difference between a magnitude and a multitude 
is in their divisibility. A multitude can only be dissolved into its constituent units or combinations of these units. The units themselves are indivisible. Thus there is no number that falls between 1 and 2. The Greeks could of course conceive of fractions, but whereas we are accustomed to thinking of one half or one third as standalone quantities, the Greeks preferred to think of them as relationships. The number two is half of four, which means that four stands to two in a two to one proportion. But there is no such quantity as one half in itself. One half is always one half of something. This is why in Greek texts on music, and in this video series, we talk about ratios, but not fractions. By contrast to multitudes, magnitudes can be divided at any point. If this continuous mass represents the number 100, I can divide it exactly in half by cutting it here at the 50% mark. But I could also divide it here. This point slices the magnitude at a little more than 94% of its total length. To be precise, it is located at the reciprocal of the twelfth root of 2. If this magnitude is a string, then the ratio of the string's total length to the length of the stopped string is the twelfth root of 2 to 1. This is the place to stop the string to produce a note an equal tempered semitone higher than the note produced by the full string. If the full string is C, then the stopped string is C sharp or D flat. I can make a division this precise when using a geometric magnitude, but just try dividing a multitude of 100 this way. You can't do it without drawing a line through a unit. Even if I break it down into 1000 squares, the line will still have to cross through a unit. In fact, no matter how many units you break the quantity down into, you'll never be able to divide the multitude into a pair of whole numbers. The best you can do is approximate the correct division, with better and better approximations the more units you use, but it will never be possible to produce exactly the ratio of the twelfth root of 2 to 1 by dividing a multitude. This is because the twelfth root of 2 is an irrational number. An irrational number is one that cannot be expressed as a ratio between any pair of whole numbers. The most common example is the square root of 2, that is, the positive number that satisfies the equation x squared equals 2. It will be impossible to divide any whole number by any other whole number and get a quantity to satisfy this equation. But it's trivially easy to construct this quantity using geometry. Consider a square where each side is one unit long. The length of the diagonal from corner to corner will be the square root of 2. I know this because of the famous Pythagorean theorem about right triangles. If I ignore half of this square, what remains is a right triangle. The theorem tells us that the square of the hypotenuse of any right triangle will be equal to the sum of the squares of the two sides. Both legs of our triangle have a length of 1, so the square of the hypotenuse will equal 1 squared plus 1 squared, or 1 plus 1, which equals 2. If the square of the hypotenuse equals 2, then the hypotenuse itself will equal the square root of 2. Thomas Heath, the historian of Greek mathematics, suspected that this was the first irrational quantity to be discovered, and the Pythagorean tradition has a series of unsettling legends about a mathematician named Hippasus who was banished or killed for revealing the discovery of this number's irrationality. Another famous example of an irrational number is the ratio of the circumference of a circle to its diameter. If I construct a circle with a diameter of one unit, its circumference will be slightly larger than three units. This relationship is illustrated in this famous diagram from Wikipedia created by John Reed. This irrational quantity is an important physical constant with many engineering applications, so the Greeks assigned the letter pi to it. We still use this symbol today 
because pi is an irrational number, the two sides of the ratio that make it up cannot both be whole numbers. In the previous example, the diameter of the circle was 1, which meant that the circumference of the circle was equal to a little more than 3, or exactly pi. On the other hand, if the circumference of the circle is exactly 3, then the diameter will be a weird number slightly less than 1. To be precise, it will equal 3 times the reciprocal of pi. The two quantities that stand in a ratio to make up pi, the circumference and diameter of the circle, are incommensurable. So, for example, no matter how many times I stack the two quantities side by side, they will never make stacks of equal height. This geometric notion of incommensurability is closely related to the theory of irrational numbers, which is why the Greeks pursued this branch of mathematics through geometry and not arithmetic. Why does any of this matter? Well, we've just shown that irrational numbers are easy to produce and manipulate using geometry, but they fall totally beyond the scope of ancient Greek arithmetic, and by extension, music. But irrational numbers play an important role in the modern mathematics of music. For example, Many important musical intervals cannot be divided into any number of equal parts without using irrational numbers. The division actually contains a proof of this surprising fact which has far-reaching implications for music. If irrational numbers are out of the question, it follows that ancient Greek harmonics will be restricted to the quantities we can find using good honest numbers, the positive whole numbers, or counting numbers, and the ratios between them. This is a tacit assumption of the ancient Greeks, who did not have well-developed ways of dealing with irrational numbers in arithmetic. But it can be confusing to modern readers who are used to such technologies as decimal notation, calculators, root extraction, and the Cartesian coordinate plane. In other words, we are accustomed to a much higher level of abstraction than the ancient Greeks, and to technologies that take some of the burden of calculation off of us. If you find that the mathematics of the division seem overly restrictive, you're not wrong. But these restrictions are not arbitrary. They grow out of the level of mathematical knowledge the ancient Greeks had access to. Before we go on to categorizing ratios, let's talk about some terminology. I want to make a rough distinction between ratio and proportion. A ratio is a comparison between two specific numbers. A proportion is an abstract relationship that can be expressed by many ratios. So 2 to 1, 6 to 3, and 10 to 5 are all different ratios, but they express the same proportion. The 2 to 1 ratio is the best representative of this proportion since it is in its lowest terms. That is, no smaller pair of numbers expresses the same proportion as 2 to 1. The ancient Greeks had names for certain important proportions. The names are shown in this table. You don't really need to memorize these names since they are self-explanatory if you understand the Greek words they come from. The proportion expressed in its lowest terms as 2 to 1 is known as the duple proportion. The proportion expressed as 3 to 1 is the triple. 4 to 1 is the quadruple. The proportion expressed in its lowest terms as 3 to 2 is called the hemiolic. This term will be familiar to musicians from the word hemiola, a 3 against 2 rhythmic figure. The word hemiolic indicates that the larger number in the ratio contains the smaller number once in addition to one half of the smaller number. The proportion expressed in its lowest terms as 4 to 3 is called the epitritic, a term which means 1 plus a third. The proportion expressed in its lowest terms as 9 to 8 is called the epagdoic, 1 plus an eighth. These terms will come up throughout the division, but I will be sure to remind you of their meaning as they arise. 
Music is the science of relative multitude. Therefore, we will always be dealing with ratios of unequal numbers. One will be larger, and one will be smaller. I will generally notate ratios with the larger number first and the smaller number second, although it is occasionally convenient to reverse the order for the purposes of visual presentation. Since it comes first, we'll call the larger number the antecedent, and we'll call the smaller number, which comes second, the consequent. The difference between the antecedent and the consequent is called the excess, that is, the amount by which the larger number exceeds the smaller. On occasion, we'll put more than two numbers together in a series, such as 2, 4, 8, 16. These numbers are said to be in continued proportion, which means that there is a constant proportion between each pair of adjacent numbers in the series. So 2 to 4, 4 to 8, and 8 to 16 all express the same proportion. In a finite series, we call the first and last numbers the extremes, and all the numbers that fall between are called means. So much for terminology. Now let's discuss the types of ratio, one of the main topics of the ancient Greek science of music. The division of the canon invokes different categories of ratios, but it does not explain them at any significant length. Categorizing ratios was an important part of the ancient Greek science of music, but our clearest and most complete discussion of these categories comes from a relatively late source, the Greek mathematician Nicomachus writing in the 1st century AD. Nicomachus wrote a manual of harmonics but I've based my discussion here on his Introduction to Arithmetic, which is widely available in an easy-to-read translation from the early 20th century. Ancient Greek mathematicians divided ratios into three main categories, multiple, epimoric, and epimeric. Beyond these, there are two derivative and less important categories, the multiple epimoric and the multiple epimeric. In a multiple ratio, the antecedent is a multiple of the consequent. This means that the smaller number can measure the larger a whole number of times, with no remainder left over. Consequently, when we reduce a multiple ratio to its lowest terms, it will always take the form of n to 1, where n is any whole number greater than 1. Take as an example the ratio 6 to 2. The larger number, 6, is a multiple of 2. If we try to measure the larger number in units of 2, we find that it can be done a whole number of times with no remainder left over. Finally, when we reduce the ratio to its lowest terms, we find 3 to 1. So 6 to 2 is a multiple ratio. Epimoric ratios are also called superparticular ratios. One term is Greek and the other is Latin, but they both mean the same thing. In this series, I prefer to use the Greek terms simply because they are shorter and easier to remember. But in your reading, you may come across the Latin terms, especially in older sources. In an epimoric ratio, both numbers are divisible by the excess of the larger number over the smaller. If we use this excess to measure both numbers, we find that it measures them a whole number of times with no remainder. Consequently, when we reduce an epimoric ratio to its lowest terms, the two numbers are always consecutive counting numbers, like 5 to 4 or 6 to 5. Take for example the ratio 12 to 9. The excess of 12 over 9 is 3. If we take this excess, we can use it to measure the larger number, 12, a whole number of times with no remainder. Taking the same quantity, 3, we can also use it to measure the lower number, 9, a whole number of times with no remainder.
If we reduce the ratio to its lowest terms, we get 4 to 3, two consecutive whole numbers. So 12 to 9 is an epimoric ratio. The multiple and epimoric ratios are the only ones that play a major role in harmonics. It is important to remember their definitions since much of the division will involve exploring the properties of these ratios. For the sake of completeness, I will take you through the remaining three categories, but it is not necessary to remember the details because they will not arise often in your future reading. Epimeric ratios are also called superpartient ratios. Again, one term is Greek and the other is Latin, but they mean the same. An epimeric ratio is any ratio which is neither multiple nor epimoric, but in which the two numbers are divisible by a common unit. If we reduce this ratio to its lowest terms, we will get two whole numbers that are relatively prime to each other, that is, they do not share any factors, and are not consecutive. Take for example the ratio 10 to 6. We can easily see that 10 is not a multiple of 6 and that 6 does not measure 10. The excess of 10 over 6 is 4, which does not measure either quantity. So this ratio is neither multiple nor epimoric. However, the two numbers are still divisible by a common unit. If we reduce this ratio to its lowest terms, we get 5 to 3. These numbers are relatively prime and they are not consecutive. So 10 to 6 is an epimeric ratio. Earlier, I mentioned two derivative and less important categories of ratio. The categories of epimoric and epimeric ratios only apply in cases where the smaller number measures the larger only once with a remainder left over. If the remainder serves as a common measure of both sides of the ratio, it is epimoric. Otherwise, it is epimeric. If the smaller number measures the larger more than once with a remainder left over, then the ratio is either multiple epimoric or multiple epimeric. If the remainder serves as a common measure of both sides of the ratio, it is multiple epimoric. Otherwise, it is multiple epimeric. Take the ratio 21 to 9, for example. 9 measures 21 twice, leaving behind a remainder of 3. This remainder can evenly measure both terms. So 21 to 9 is a multiple epimoric ratio. Now take the example of the ratio 11 to 4. 4 measures 11 twice, leaving behind a remainder of 3. This remainder is not a common measure of both terms. In fact, it doesn't evenly measure either term. So 11 to 4 is a multiple epimeric ratio. These categories exhaust all possibilities for ratios between numbers that have a common measure. If this is too much to remember, don't despair. Again, only multiple and epimoric ratios play an important role in harmonics. We can boil all this material down to three simple statements. If a ratio reduces to n to 1, then it is multiple. If a ratio reduces to a pair of consecutive numbers, it is epimoric. Otherwise, the ratio is something else. We've already said that the science of ratios inherently deals with unequal numbers because there is no comparison to be made between equal numbers. So all ratios are inequalities. But unequal pairs of numbers have different degrees of perfection. The degree of perfection is proportional to the number's distance from equality. In a multiple ratio, the larger number is actually composed of the smaller one. The two terms of the ratio must be unequal, but here they are closely bound together in a part-whole relationship. This makes the multiple ratio the most perfect of the unequal relationships. The epimoric ratio compares two numbers that are as close as they can get without being equal. The two numbers have a common measure aside from their common unit, 
they are both measured by the excess of the larger number over the smaller. The numbers may not be equal, but they're close and closely related. So the epimoric ratio is not as perfect as the multiple, but it still has a high degree of perfection. Let's return to the table of intervals from the previous video and classify all the intervals we've found. The octave, twelfth, and double octave are all multiple ratios. The fourth and fifth are epimoric ratios. In an epimeric ratio, the two numbers are as unrelated as they can possibly be without being totally incommensurable. So the epimeric ratio is the least perfect of the three ratios. And within the two octave system, no important interval is represented by an epimeric ratio. Imagine how remarkable this fact must have seemed. For early civilizations like the Greeks, practical investigations in fields such as engineering led to a gradual discovery of the elegant mathematical order of nature. Numbers often took on a mystical or occult significance, and the recurrence of important numerical relationships in different places seemed to provide evidence of a divine order underlying everything we see. This sense of the mystical significance of numbers was taken to an extreme by the Pythagoreans. The Pythagoreans were a mystery cult centered on the shadowy figure of Pythagoras, a mathematician who lived in the 6th century BC on the island of Samos. Pythagorean thought was influential throughout antiquity, with many writers either drawing inspiration from it or directly opposing it. One of the most important symbols to the Pythagoreans is called the Tetractus of the Decad. The Tetractus is the number 10 figured as an equilateral triangle with layers of 1, 2, 3, and 4 units. Like us, the Greeks used base 10 numerals. We and they express numbers greater than 10 as some quantity of tens plus some quantity of units. So 17 is 10 plus 7. This gives our number system a cyclical character centered on the number 10, the number of units in the Tetractus. The four tranches of the Tetractus provide not only the first four counting numbers, but also the fundamental proportions, duple, triple, quadruple, hemiolic, and epitritic. And these proportions underlie the most important intervals in music. The Tetractus thus serves as a nexus point between science, art, and sympathetic magic. The power of the Tetractus is illustrated in a legend that recurs in many Greek writings, the story of Pythagoras at the Forge. You can find several versions of this legend in Andrew Barker's anthology of Greek musical writings. The story goes that Pythagoras was walking by a forge one day when he heard that the clanging of the hammers rang out in pure consonant intervals. He rushed into the forge and asked to weigh the hammers, and was delighted to find their proportions were those found in the Tetractus. In this way, he discovered the intervals of ancient Greek harmonics. Of course, modern-day pedants never tire of pointing out that this story is impossible, since the acoustics of ringing bodies do not work the same way as the acoustics of vibrating strings so a 10-pound hammer will not actually produce a note an octave higher than a 20-pound hammer. But Andre Barbera points out that this fact would only seem to make the legend more powerful. The relationships worked for the wise and powerful Pythagoras, but not for anyone else. In our discussion above, we left out one interval, the 11th, or octave plus fourth. Somewhat embarrassingly, this is the only interval within the two-octave system that we would consider consonant and is not represented by a multiple or epimoric ratio. The 8 to 3 ratio is a multiple epimeric, which is not a particularly close relationship between two numbers. This fact presents a problem. Do we consider the 11th to be consonant despite its bad ratio?
This seems to do justice to our experience, although it ruins the elegance of being able to correlate ratio categories directly with consonants. Some ancient writers took this path, such as the famous astronomer Claudius Ptolemaeus, or Ptolemy, who argued that the eleventh is consonant because any consonant interval remains consonant when we compound it by an octave. Or, do we consider the eleventh to be dissonant despite what experience tells us? This would give us a consistent system, but it seems to do violence to our musical intuition. Many ancient writers were at least ambivalent about calling the eleventh a consonant interval, and the notion of the dissonant eleventh had a surprisingly long afterlife. It resurfaces in the early 18th century with Jean-Philippe Rameau, who used it to make a fundamental distinction between the consonant fourth, which arises from inversion of the fifth, and the dissonant eleventh, which arises in chords containing a four to three suspension. Various authors in late antiquity and the early medieval era had different ways of dealing with the problem of the eleventh. The author or authors of the division took the simplest route. The treatise simply doesn't discuss the status of the eleventh at all. In harmonics, there are two basic operations for finding new notes or constructing new intervals. One is addition combining two intervals to make a larger one. The other is subtraction, taking the difference between a larger interval and a smaller one. These musical operations with intervals correspond to mathematical operations with ratios. As an example of adding ratios together, let's consider adding a perfect fourth to a perfect fifth. I begin by taking the note a perfect fourth above my fundamental. Taking a perfect fifth above that note, I get an octave above my fundamental. So a fourth plus a fifth equals an octave. In this example, I have a series of three notes. I can join together the two intervals to make a larger interval because they share the middle note in common. The middle note participates in two intervals. It is simultaneously the upper note of the fourth and the lower note of the fifth. And my sum interval, the octave, is the interval between the lowest note and the highest note. It's the same with ratios. Say I want to add the ratios 4 to 3 and 6 to 4. I have a series of three numbers, 3, 4, and 6. The middle number, 4, participates in two ratios. It is the antecedent to 3 and the consequent to 6. The ratio between the extremes, the outer numbers, is 6 to 3. So the sum of the two ratios is 6 to 3. This only works, of course, if the two ratios we want to add together share a common number. The middle term of the series has to serve as the antecedent of one ratio and the consequent of the other. Just as in the musical example above, the note C served as the upper note of one interval and the lower note of the other. But very often we'll want to add ratios that don't share a number in common. If that's the case, there's an extra step involved. Any time we're adding or subtracting ratios, what we're really interested in is their proportions. So we're not interested in the specific numbers that make up the ratio, but only the relationship between these numbers. This means that we can freely multiply one side of a ratio by any number we choose, as long as we multiply the other side by the same number. As long as we apply the same operation to both the antecedent and the consequent, the proportion between them will remain the same. We'll demonstrate this in a moment, but for now, let's move on. The second basic musical operation is taking the difference between two intervals. If I take a large interval, such as an octave, and find a smaller interval, such as a perfect fourth above its fundamental, I indirectly create a new interval of a perfect fifth between the middle note and the upper note of the original octave. 
So an octave minus a fourth equals a fifth. In this example, I have a series of three notes. I'm able to take away the smaller interval from the larger one because they share a note in common. The lowest note participates in both intervals. It is simultaneously the lower note of the octave and the lower note of the fourth. And my difference interval, the perfect fifth, is the interval between the two upper notes that remain when we take away the interval from G to C. It's the same with ratios. Let's say I have the ratio 6 to 3, and I want to subtract 4 to 3 from it. Combining these two ratios, I get a series of three numbers, 3, 4, and 6. The lowest number, 3, participates in both ratios. It is the consequence both to 4 and to 6. The ratio between the upper two numbers is 6 to 4. This is the difference between 6 to 3 and 4 to 3. Again, this only works if the two ratios share a number in common. In subtracting, both ratios must share the same consequent. The difference between the two ratios will be the ratio between their two antecedents. If our two ratios do not share a number in common, we'll need to multiply one or both of them by some number until they do. This explanation has been a little wordy, but bear with me. In adding or subtracting a pair of ratios, we are adding or subtracting a pair of relationships, which is a much more abstract thing than adding or subtracting a pair of numbers. Understanding the operation is quite a bit easier if you can visualize it. To make things even easier, I'm going to show you an arithmetic shortcut for adding and subtracting ratios, one which you may already know and which we already used in the last video. This shortcut will work regardless of whether the ratios in question share a common number. After that, we'll visually walk through the process of carrying out these operations. The shortcut will help you make sure you know what the right answer is ahead of time. The visual walkthrough will, I hope, make it more clear what we are actually doing when we add or subtract a pair of ratios. The shortcut to handling ratios arithmetically is to treat them just like fractions. This actually comes naturally to us. We're accustomed to thinking of ratios and fractions simultaneously as relationships between pairs of numbers and as real quantities in their own right, through their translatability into decimal notation. This way of thinking about things is foreign to ancient Greek arithmetic but that doesn't mean we can't use it as a crutch. To add two ratios, simply multiply them as if they were fractions. To multiply a pair of fractions, we first multiply the numerators together and then the denominators. To multiply a pair of ratios then, we first multiply the antecedents and then the consequence. Usually we will reduce the result to its lowest terms if possible. As an example, let's add the ratio 4 to 3 to itself. To do this, we multiply the antecedents together and then the consequence. 4 times 4 is 16. 3 times 3 is 9. So our compounded ratio is 16 to 9, which is in lowest terms. To subtract two ratios, we divide them as if they were fractions. The simplest way to divide one fraction by another is to invert the divisor and then multiply. So to divide one ratio by another, we will first invert the divisor, then we will multiply the antecedents and consequence of the new pair of ratios. As an example, let's take the ratio 3 to 2 and subtract 4 to 3 from it. 4 to 3 is our divisor, so we will start by inverting it. Now the problem is to add the ratios 3 to 2 and 3 to 4. To do this, we first multiply the antecedents. 3 times 3 is 9. Then we multiply the consequence. 2 times 4 is 8. So 3 to 2 minus 4 to 3 is 9 to 8. All this is easy enough and probably familiar from middle school math.
but what are we actually doing when we add or subtract two ratios? To explain, it will help to visualize the process. Let's return to our first example. We were adding together the ratios 4 to 3 and 6 to 4. We'll begin by setting these ratios on separate lines. The two blue numbers, the antecedent of the first ratio and the consequent of the second ratio, are lined up in a column. This is the common term with which we want to join the two ratios into a series of three numbers. Because these two blue numbers are equal, we can immediately collapse the two ratios onto a single line, creating a series of three numbers, 3, 4, and 6. The ratio between the first and last terms of the series will be the sum we're looking for. So 4 to 3 plus 6 to 4 equals 6 to 3. In lowest terms, we express this as 2 to 1. In this example, the two ratios shared a number in common. The antecedent of one ratio was equal to the consequent of the other. This made it very easy to put the three numbers involved into a series and pick out the extremes. Now let's revisit an example where we can't do this and we have to deal with an extra step. In this example, we're adding the ratio 4 to 3 to itself. Earlier, we already calculated that the result of this addition should be a ratio of 16 to 9. Let's keep that in mind as we work through the example. We begin by setting the two ratios on different lines. The antecedent of the first ratio and the consequent of the second ratio are lined up in a column. We want these two blue numbers to be a common term that we can use to join the two ratios into a series. The two blue numbers are not equal, which means we can't put these numbers into a series just yet. The easiest way to make the two blue numbers equal is to multiply them together. 4 times 3 and 3 times 4. If I multiply one side of a ratio by a number, I have to multiply the other side by the same number. This means I have to multiply my purple number by 3 and my orange number by 4. Let's carry out the multiplication. Both my blue numbers now equal 12, so I can reduce everything down to one series of numbers. 3 times 3 is 9, and 4 times 4 is 16. So my series of numbers is 9, 12, and 16. This series is in its lowest terms and cannot be reduced. The ratio between the two lower numbers is 12 to 9, which is equivalent to 4 to 3. The ratio between the two higher numbers is 16 to 12, which is also equivalent to 4 to 3. The sum of these two ratios is expressed by the extremes of the series, 16 to 9. So 4 to 3 plus 4 to 3 equals 16 to 9. This is the answer we calculated earlier using the arithmetic shortcut. Now let's look at some examples of subtracting ratios. Earlier we were taking the ratio 6 to 3 and subtracting 4 to 3 from it. We begin by setting the two ratios on separate lines. The purple and orange numbers are spread apart because these will be the extremes of our series. We need space for a third number in between them. The two purple numbers are lined up in a column. This is the common term we want to use to join the two ratios together into a series of three numbers. Because these two ratios share a common consequent, we can immediately put them together into a series of three numbers, 3, 4, and 6. The ratio between the two largest terms is the difference we're looking for. So 6 to 3 minus 4 to 3 is 6 to 4. We can express this ratio in its lowest terms as 3 to 2. In this example, our two ratios shared a common consequent, which enabled us to immediately place them in a series. 
Now let's look at an example where the ratios do not share a common consequent and we cannot immediately place them in a series. In this example, we are taking the ratio 3 to 2 and subtracting 4 to 3 from it. Again, we begin by laying out the ratios on separate lines. The orange and purple numbers are spread apart to leave room for a third number between them. The two purple numbers are lined up in a column. Because our purple numbers are not equal, we cannot immediately put these numbers into a series. We'll have to multiply each ratio by some number in order to get ratios that share a common term. The easiest way to do this is to multiply our purple numbers together, 2 times 3 and 3 times 2. If I multiply one side of a ratio by a number, I have to multiply the other side by the same number. So I have to multiply my blue number by 2, and I have to multiply my orange number by 3. Let's multiply these out and see what we get. Both my purple numbers now equal 6. So now we can put the three numbers into a series in the same row. 4 times 2 equals 8, and 3 times 3 equals 9. So I have a series of three numbers, 6, 8, and 9. The ratio between the first and last numbers in the series is 9 to 6, which is equivalent to 3 to 2, the ratio I started with. And the ratio between the first two numbers in the series is 8 to 6, which is equivalent to 4 to 3, the ratio I was subtracting from my initial ratio. This series tells me that 9 to 6 minus 8 to 6 equals 9 to 8. Let's summarize the procedure for adding one ratio to another. If the ratios have a common term, so that the consequent of one ratio is equal to the antecedent of the other, you can put the three numbers into a series immediately. The middle term of the series will participate in both ratios. The sum of the two ratios is expressed by the outer terms of the series. If the ratios do not have a common term, you will have to multiply each ratio by some number until they do. Once you're done this multiplication, you can place the three numbers in a series and take the ratio between the extremes. Now, just to be safe, let's go through one last example, adding the ratios 2 to 1 and 4 to 3. At this point, I encourage you to pause the video to work through the steps yourself and resume watching to check your work. We begin by laying out our two ratios on separate lines. Our blue numbers, the antecedent of one ratio and the consequent of the other, are lined up in a column. Our two blue numbers are not equal, so we can't immediately join these ratios into a series. We'll have to multiply them by something. The easiest way to ensure the two blue numbers are equal to each other is to multiply them together. 2 times 3, and 3 times 2. If we multiply one side of a ratio by a number, we have to multiply the other side by the same number. So we multiply the purple number by 3, and the orange number by 2. Let's multiply these out and see what we get. The blue numbers are now both equal to 6. So we can combine these numbers onto a single line. 1 times 3 is 3, and 4 times 2 is 8. So our series is 3, 6, and 8. This is in its lowest terms and cannot be reduced. The ratio between the two lower numbers is 6 to 3, which is equivalent to 2 to 1, the ratio we started with. The ratio between the two higher numbers is 8 to 6, which is equivalent to 4 to 3, the ratio we were adding to 2 to 1. So the sum of 6 to 3 and 8 to 6 is expressed by the ratio between the two extremes, which is 8 to 3. Just to check our work, let's use the arithmetic shortcut. If I want to add the ratios 2 to 1 and 4 to 3, I multiply them like fractions. 
so my ratio will be 2 times 4 to 1 times 3. 2 times 4 is 8, and 1 times 3 is 3, so my sum is 8 to 3. Now let's summarize the procedure for subtracting one ratio from another. If the two ratios share a common consequent, we can immediately combine them into a series. The lowest number of the series will participate in both ratios. The difference between the two ratios will be expressed by the ratio between their antecedents, the two higher numbers of the series. If the ratios do not share a common consequent, we will have to manipulate them until they do. Once we've done this, we put the numbers into a series and take the ratio between the antecedents. Now let's try one last example. Taking 3 to 1 and subtracting 9 to 8 from it. At this point, I suggest you pause the video, work through the steps yourself, and then resume watching to check your work. We start by putting our two ratios on separate lines. The purple and orange numbers will be the extremes of the series, so we spread them out to leave room in the middle. The two purple numbers are the common term where we want to join the two ratios together, so we line them up in a column. Our two purple numbers are not equal, which means we can't immediately put these numbers into a series we'll have to multiply the purple numbers together, 1 times 8 and 8 times 1. If we multiply one side of the ratio by a number, we have to multiply the other side by the same number. So we have to multiply our blue number by 1, and we have to multiply our orange number by 8. Let's see what we get when we multiply these out. Both our purple numbers are now equal to 8 which means we can now reduce everything onto one line. 9 times 1 is 9, and 3 times 8 is 24. So our ratios make a series of three numbers, 8, 9, and 24. This series is in its lowest terms and can't be reduced. The ratio between the extremes of the series is 24 to 8 which is equivalent to 3 to 1, the ratio we started with. The ratio between the two lower terms of the series is 9 to 8, which is the ratio we wanted to subtract from 3 to 1. The difference between the two is expressed as the ratio between the two higher terms of the series, which is 24 to 9. This reduces to 8 to 3. Once again, we can check our work using the arithmetic shortcut. If I want to take 3 to 1 and subtract 9 to 8 from it, I do this by dividing 3 to 1 by 9 to 8, as if these numbers were fractions. We divide fractions by inverting the divisor and then multiplying. So the problem is now 3 times 8 to 1 times 9. 3 times 8 is 24, and 1 times 9 is 9. So the difference between 3 to 1 and 9 to 8 is 24 to 9, which we can reduce to 8 to 3. This completes the ground we need to cover in order to start looking at the propositions of the division. In the next video, we will jump right in with Proposition 1. I hope these examples and diagrams have been helpful for you, and I encourage you to practice on your own. Pick your own pairs of musical ratios and try adding or subtracting them. Once you've done it a couple of times, you will easily get the hang of it. Again, if you have any questions, comments, or suggestions, you are always welcome to mention them in the comments section or to contact me privately. I am making these videos out of personal interest, but I'm always glad to hear that people are getting something out of watching them. If you are enjoying this series, you can help me out by liking this video and subscribing to my channel. Thanks for watching.